So we're looking at minimalism. Uh, we looked at Carl Andre and we looked at uh, Donald Judd. So moving on now to look at Morris. This is untitled Knox, 1961. It's even more reductive column, 1961. Yeah, he, um, yeah, he, he, it's a case, I suppose, with all these minimalist artists that they're like very simple forms. At first, it seems like they're in love with, with geometry, but in a way, they're, they're sort of subverting geometry, you could say, by making the form so simple that then, then what happens is that it somehow undermines uh, simplicity. Very, he likes his, these very easy to read gestalts or f of forms. He says he prefers forms which are dominated by wholeness. There's no parts that add up to a whole, it's just some kind of immediately obvious whole, no composition. And by making that so simple, then the, the and this is true of other minimalist work too. The concern is more shifted towards the the relationship between the viewer and the artwork, and perhaps Morris, even more than Carl Andre, is, is concerned with that, the phenomenology of perception. You know, the the great sort of philosopher of um, phenomenology is Merleau Ponty, a French writer. His Phenomenology of Perception, a book of 1945 is a sort of foundational for thinking about that field. Um, so this is the, the you know, where Morris is at. This, uh, one of his very early minimalist work, 1961, it's a plywood block. And actually, when he first presented it, he presented it in a, a kind of theatrical setting. Uh, as a sort of seven minutes piece, it just stood there on an empty stage like this vertically for three and a half minutes and then it was toppled over for another uh, three and a half minutes. You know? So, so slightly performative, you know, time dimension coming in. He used a rope to, to turn, turn it over, tip it over. Originally he was sort of planning to be inside it and kind of it over but actually decided against doing that. We do have this um, related work by him untitled Box for Standing 1961. Well, he, yeah, yeah the size of it is all, all obviously related to the size of a human figure. Um, there's that kind of sense of a presence like a human presence about it. It's another work where you get that, that sense of an inside and an outside, I box, 1962. It can, it's got a little door that can open up. Uh, this is what's inside, it's a photo. So it's, again, it's kind of him inside. columns. Well, it's almost the same idea, but instead of temporally, it's there spatially, the two things together, rather than the same thing in two states. Corner piece, some type of corner piece, 1964. So it starts to become a little bit more about the, the environment rather than the thing in, thing in itself you could say, making you aware of the cor corner of the room. Very neutral, you know, these tend to be like plywood sculpt uh, uh, structures and then just very simply painted. So drawing attention to the space itself 
but also to your viewing of, of, of that space and your movement through it, your embodied nature as a viewer. You know, a, a lot of um, the viewer of perspectival painting is often constructed as just being an eye, a sort of disembodied eye. But, um, and even the viewer, say, of a, a Frank Stella painting maybe is like a kind of just an eye in a way. But here you, you're you're given back your whole body in in your viewing. You're given back the time of viewing as well. Viewing is a process. So he might fill up a whole exhibition space uh, with with various of these. So whether you want to see them as individual works or whether you want to treat the whole thing as one installation, it starts to be ambiguous. So, so much a later art becomes interested, uh, escapes from formalist purity. Its concern is with the ent entire environment. But minimalism is almost always, they, they still want to stay with the the white cube space that art, that pure formalist art lived in. Other artists will also then explore more um, everyday environments and so forth for installation art. But this is one of the characteristics of of minimalism. It tends to live within purified environments that that modern art had been comfortable with already. So this is the installation view of his show in the Green Gallery, New York, 1964. Uh, this is a work that's now in the Tate Gallery in, in London, the Mirrored Cubes, 1965. Again, very simple form, but the, he's, then he's uh, mirrored the external surfaces of them. So the environment starts to be in the work itself. It's reflecting the environment. Even the viewer starts to be in the work itself because your reflection is there. Of course, it's a very simple strategy for achieving that goal. There are four. You only see three here. What fourth is out of the, the picture. And because of the mirroring, you're, you're very aware of how things are changing as you move around more so than you would be with the simple painted surfaces. Continuous project all to date daily, 1969. So that's from the, the, the end of that decade. So he's emphasizing here process rather than finished works. That's something a little bit new coming in. Um, he did another work which was kind of like process in a hidden way. That was called Box with the Sound of Its Own Making. It was another of these simple box forms that he produced. But there was, a, in coming from the box, was a tape recording of the sound of the making of that box. So he found a way to bring a time dimension in, even though there's actually no time dimension in your, you know, in, in the viewing directly. You, know, you, you, you didn't see the making, you only see the final result. But through sound, that process is brought in. There's the space and time of viewing, there's the space and time of making. And of course, in illusionistic art, there is space and time represented, uh, the illusion of a space, you know, like a mirror through to another world or something like that in an illusionistic painting. But all that kind of illusionistic space and illusionistic um, temporal moments sort of disappear in it, all this abstract art. So it's more primarily about the time of viewing, the focus there. Although sometimes the time of making could be of interest too. A lot of modernist art, you know, Cezanne, you're very aware of him making individual marks on a surface. So you're aware of the, the painting as a made object, made over time, temporality of making. 
instead of illusionistic art where everything seems to have been made in one instance you know as if you're there at the same time when the artist saw it and the artist saw it in one moment which was it's always an illusion you know, you, you know an image is made over many many moments maybe a photograph could be made in a 60th of a second or something like that uh, but not a, not an oil painting usually so here he's got various material um, you know, like piles of clay or sand on wooden platforms moving them around by shuffle so every day he alters it and then he documents each work in days uh, a day's work in photos and those photos start to appear in the exhibition space itself so foregrounding process or temporality somehow it's all I mean one path one dimension of all this is somehow moving art beyond the status of being a commodity some kind of saleable object uh, it's a sort of a rejection of the marketplace now these are some views from his retrospective exhibition at the Tate Gallery in London in, in 1971 it was kind of a um, an event that uh, was a little bit controversial you know a lot of people critique the works for being like a gym or a children's playground or an assault course you know because they were interactive here you're actually invited to to get involved with the artworks in a, a, in a direct in, embodied way you know even when you're just walking around them like with the mirrored surface cubes your body is somehow more in play uh, as a spectator but here you're physically inside or on top of the sculpture you could walk across those Andre uh, flat floor pieces as well but this is a more active involvement so a, a kind of the notion of interactivity is, is very much one of our age but this is something coming into art for, for the first time in a way so for some to some people's way of looking at it it's an advance and other people's way of looking at it it's a sort of trivialization of a, a kind of uh, yeah like i say a sort of playground idea uh so the idea he just used uh, non-art materials accessed you know, purchase locally cheap reusable preformed materials like piping and so forth uh, and made up the works out of that and invited the audience participation in this way it requires a, a sort of choreographic uh, response from from the viewers you can't just stand there looking at it somehow you haven't got the artwork if you haven't got involved with it but um, actually what happened was that you know there was the, the danger of people getting hurt and things like that so it becomes uh, an issue and and, and uh, the artworks themselves were, were, were being damaged uh, and the visitors were being damaged a little bit or in danger of it so for after five days the exhibition was closed and then reopened again after six days so the director of the, the Tate had to write a letter to the trustees explaining what was going on and he said it was due to the exuberant and excited behavior <laughs> which you you know is that a bad thing I don't know maybe it's, maybe that was a, a good thing and something to be encouraged it's certainly different from the uh, uh, a certain kind of solemn approach to the art gallery and so questioning what art galleries sh should be uh, the dance connection is interesting because he, his uh, both his first and his second wife were themselves dancers so he's very involved with with, with dance his second wife is Yvonne Rayner who's quite an import, important figure in, in that kind of dance the Dun just Jun Judson Dance Theatre in, in New York uh, it, gets, it was in a they were based in a kind of uh, 
uh, a former church, deconsecrated church. There are some quite interesting essays that Morris wrote about his practice. Uh, uh, there's one called Notes on Sculpture. Actually, there's a whole series of essays between 1966 and 1969 published in the journal Art Forum. Some of the works are made of um, non-stiff uh, material, so this is untitled uh, felt. 1967 redone 1970 of course each time it will be slightly different so there's some kind of random element comes in sometimes he's using like scatter and uh, other kind of random processes to generate forms more about process than than about form perhaps you, you can you, you think about how the form was generated Dan Flavin, he's famous for one thing, and that is the, the use of neon, the use of light. Of course, you know, light is an important factor in art. You know, earlier I was talking about how you might have a checklist of words you might use when you describe a, an artwork. Light could be one of them. Um, impressionism, for instance, is famously about representing light, atmospheric effects. But there's a big difference between representing light in pigment, which is what painters tend to do, and using actual light, photons being emitted, actual light energy there. And that's what Flavin is doing. But particularly the sort of modern forms of, uh, of, of artificial light. Neon has a history. Uh, of course now that history is sort of coming to an end really uh, with with LED lighting and all kind of more recent lighting technologies starting to replace it. Hong Kong was a city where neon was really very big. There's a whole project on the M Plus website about neon. Uh, that's might be interesting to you and they, they like for example well they, they ask people to send in their favorite neon signs in Hong Kong and there's also some artworks about neon there's an interview with the film the cinematographer Chris Doyle Hong Kong based cinematographer about neon in in his films that he, he worked on anyway so it, neon is one thing in specific to modern life you know it's interesting for an artist to be working with that material so it's about working with light but it's also working which is a, a thing in all times and places but it's also look, working with neon or particular modern forms of, of, of lighting fluorescent tubing actually the gas inside may not be neon it may be other gases but anyway let's, let's call it fluorescent tubing then maybe and ev it's a kind of everyday material anyway. It's not an artist material. It's a sort of industrially produced material. And now, perhaps something of a conservator's nightmare. How do you, you know, how do you replace these things when they, they break and so forth? This is an early work. Um, just using these light bulbs, really. Icon Five, Corns. Broadway Flesh, 1962. It's sort of giving you away something that about the origins of minimalism. It's a kind of art, basically dealing with three dimensions. But a lot of it, a lot of it, it sort of comes from problems in painting. When painting becomes so pure, it starts to become a thing, a three D thing, an object. Um, so yeah, this is a, a kind of like a sort of painting turned into an object with, with, with light bulbs around it. The Diagonal of May 25th, 1963 to Constantin Brancusi. 
well, Rancusi, of course, famous modern sculpt sculpture, and this is some kind of homage to him. The kind of light you get from neon is a sort of cool light. It's about light, it's about color, of course. He's creating different colors and using optical mixing in a lot of cases. Here, there's just the one color, neon. Um, plus whatever is the ambient light that it's mixing with. Light spreads, so that's one way in which it connects the artwork to its surrounding space, make you aware of it as not an isolated thing, but somehow the space, space around is part of the artwork. It moves beyond physicality. There's a physical thing of the artwork, the neon, it's very simple in this case and then there's the slightly more complicated thing of all the the light spilling out into the environment and you can't quite say where the the artwork really ends I suppose monument one for B Tatlin 1964 Tatlin of course an, uh, another important modernist sculptor like Brancusi Russian constructivist this is a sort of white on white work, white white fluorescent tubes against a white background. Again, it, it's art that lives in a, a white cube space. You could think of them as lines, you know, as this is a kind of drawing if you want to think of it that way. The nominal tree to William of Ockham, 1963. Ockham is a kind of philosopher famous for Ockham's razor, the idea that, you know, you should always go for the simplest possible explanation. Very simple, one, two, three. I suppose some of the references here would be things like Barnett Newman's zip painting, the vertical lines there. So it's, it's sculptural, but it's kind of has painting as part of its frame of reference, abstract painting. Maybe some of the color ones also make you think of Morris Lewis paintings, his stripe, stripe paintings. These corner pieces might think might make, make you think of Tatlin, uh, who also produced these corner relief sculptures. We know, you know because we just looked at a work titled after him that he, that uh, Flavin is interested in his work. So here's one where there's more than one color. This is uh, untitled 1970, the cor a corner piece. Some mixing colors. Sometimes the fluorescent tubes could be facing out at us, but they're not always facing out. Sometimes they're facing inwards, so then mostly it's re reflected light we're seeing rather than direct light. So he plays between those two things. Untitled again. <laughs> to a man, George McGovern, 1972. George McGovern was an American Democratic presidential candidate. That's a topical <laughs> subject, I suppose, um, of that time, unsuccessful one. So here he's using these sort of circular forms. Uh, it's interesting. I, I just saw over the weekend, I happened to see in the IFC Mall in, in Central, I think on the, maybe it's on the second floor, I'm not quite sure, but one of the shops there, some kind of clothing store, had a sort of copy of this, a simplified copy of this work, used as part of their the decor for their uh, in installation, you know, so it's a little kind of, yeah, some, some, uh, designer for that store had been to art school, I think, <laughs> and uh, had, had seen this kind of work. So it's an appropriation for a commercial purpose.
something that often happens as as someone becomes more famous, maybe more rich, um, they get greater opportunities, and so they're able to work on a larger scale to do things that as a younger artist he would not have been able to do. So this is, you know, again, it's, take, it's an installation taking over the whole of the, the space, and it's a very large space, a Kunsthalle, a Kunsthalle in Cologne. So much more complicated, expensive to achieve, but um, yeah, with the right support it can be done. And here's another one, different views of it. So when you explain an artist's development, you have to take account of the fact that you know that sometimes it's just about what resources you have available to do a certain thing. You know. Especially with artists working in three D, you know that's one reason why often sculpture is a little less uh, avant-garde a lot of the time than painting because it has to to it's expensive to to cast that bronze. You know, it needs to be in a public place and therefore it has to be satisfactory to public tastes or at least the taste of the, the people paying for it. You could be a, a Van Gogh and have a whole lifetime's work of unsold paintings, fine, but if, if you're a sculptor working in bronze, it's not quite the same story. Eva Hess. I said last time that you know you could really see minimalism as particularly a sort of male um, movement. You know, almost all the key figures involved were, were were men in the early phase. But the one person who could be called minimalist, but who's an exception to that story, is Eva Hess. Unfortunately, she died quite young, so we never quite see where she would have ended up with, with, with her art. You can see the same kind of interest here. This is her accession to 1967. Uh, the same kind of interest in geometry, simple geometric forms. But in her case, she's, she's chosen an open form. It gives it more, I, I, to me, more like a sense of a body. There's a kind of body, even though geometry is very alien and inhuman and kind of un inorganic she sort of works against that by, by making it open form it has a kind of body like orifice like kind of quality to it um, and she's using often new materials like fiberglass on a wire mesh or steel and rubber tubing and you could even think of the way she works as a slightly kind of gendered in its references. You know, there's a, there's a sense of handicraft, of making things by hand, some kind of, uh, you know, you could relate it to the kind of tasks that women have often had assigned to them by society, you know, sewing and, uh, and so forth. So it, it has um, similarities with the the, the language of of um, minimalism, but at the same time, you could see it as a slightly subverting of it. I don't know. You could see it that way. Addendum, nineteen sixty-seven. Again, there's that slightly random. Uh, dimension of how the um, the, sort of the string like forms interact with gravity when they reach the floor and again to me there's this slightly organic quality about it all yeah 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 I think so yeah and so they both in, they both involved with this sort of um, some kind of random scattering yeah. quality and but I think uh, Morris doesn't really follow up the 
uh, I mean, there is less concern with the, the making in, in that work than not one that we saw. Uh, with her work you feel there's often a sort of repetitive labour, the same task done again and again, you know. And it, 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 and it ends up looking almost sort of hair-like or something like that. It's something uh, organic in its references that is not there with, the, with, with Morris, I think. You, you're aware of the process, the repetitive process of weaving the, you know, the, the forms through and back out. You know, so the whole inside is you just see the edge of the as it's sewn out through if you want to call it sewing Richard Sarah well um, it's a kind of a push to call him minimalist you know sometimes people might call him a post minimalist but I think his work is probably best treated in this context. Um, well, I'm just showing you frames from a, a, a film he produced, just, oh, I'm sorry, the, it's a typo, it should say hand catching lead, it says head <laughs> catching lead, which would be slightly more dangerous, uh, 1968. So a, a piece of lead is dropped and a hand tries to catch it again and again. process to do with materials and process, a action, verbs, casting, 1969. Um, yeah, this is made with lead, which is not a common metal for, for sculpture. Uh, I would say this is this is an artist trying to interact with Jackson Pollock. You know, Jackson Pollock has so much influence in, in how do you find a way to to relate to his work and take it to an, a next direction. Um, he's he's using molten lead, dangerous material. He had to wear a mask. Uh, throwing molten lead at the wall. Pollock is just pouring paint, but here he's throwing lead. So it's, it's, it's got this more kind of macho dimension to it, if you like. It's very much a, it's almost like something that you might have to do in a factory, casting some uh, something. The title, it has, is a double meaning, casting as in the way of throwing, and casting as in producing a cast. You threw the lead at the wall and it, it, it lands at the edge of the wall here and then it solidifies as it cools and after it's cooled he pulls it away and then he did the same thing again and the process over and over again until the process comes to a natural end when there's no more space and he leaves the last cast in, in the space. So he's just using the space of exhibition itself is also the space of making. So site specificity, if you like, is one of the kind of early examples of site specificity. But it's not just site specificity of, of, of display, it's site specificity of, of making, you know, making in the space you will show it. And showing the process, the process is very simple, repeat, repetitive and is laid bare. Working on the floor like Carl Andre or something, but also like Jackson Pollock painting on the floor, pouring down to the floor. Skull Cracker series, stacked steel slabs, 1969. So here he's working with a crane, like in a, a junkyard, stacking massive hunks of metal, more or less identical to each other. And again, it's a, proce a process involving repetition, and the process goes on until a naturally decided end point. That end point is when you can't add any more to the pile without it collapsing. So, yeah, it's... 
weight, um, mass, uh, it's all kind of important factors with, with Sarah. And physical danger. Yeah, you're very aware of, as a spectator, we were talking about with Richard Mor Morris, how as a spectator you're aware of your body. Yeah, with Richard Serra you're aware of your body because your body's in danger of being crushed by heavy metal falling on you. you, you you're very, even if that threat is not real, which is the case uh, in, of the pieces installed in gallery settings, still you kind of feel uh, wary of them. So this is how you're more likely to, to meet his work in a, installed in a gallery setting. A lot of the time he's working with sheets of rolled steel. So this is a uh, strike to Roberta and Rudy, 1969 to 71. It's just one single sheet. Well, we're used to these, we're used to these reductive forms in minimalism and how the whole space becomes important and, you know, the way the work looks is different from one side or another. Uh, it activates the gallery space. You're very aware of the, you know, it's there's nothing obviously holding it up. The danger, I think, is more in the installation than in the final, you know, after it's installed. The rhetoric is like a rhetoric of of of, of uh, industrial production. You know, these are big, like big sheets of of steel that are produced in a factory. He actually worked in a steel factory at one time when he was younger. Um, I would say for for most parts of the world now, that's a kind of world that sort of disappeared. I mean, there was a time when probably most men worked in factories doing productive labor you know nowadays um, you know people work in front of screens or in service industries of different kinds you know factories are all hidden away somewhere in mainland China right they don't uh, all that heavy production happens there maybe it's the everyday reality of people's life there but for most of the, the world you don't have that sense anymore of pro production it's not part of your lived everyday experience. But this is the kind of sculpture at the end of that era, maybe, of, of uh, people. There's this sort of macho, heavy labor, physical labor kind of working with materials. How many of us work with materials nowadays? It's really raw physical materials. It, it used to be very, very common. But now it's it's really kind of subtly in a generation or so it's become really rather rare. So he, he allows these steel sheets to be uh, to retain whatever traces they have of their production. He's, he, the surface is often very uh, kind of uh, the, uh, very marked, you know, even chalk marks or whatever that were put on there. Uh, in the factory or whatever so it may, may still be allowed to stay staining of the, the, the metal of some kind will, will be allowed yeah it's it's almost like a playing with with playing cards or something stacking them into make houses out of them except these are incredibly heavy pieces of, of metal so steel and, or lead are his favoured materials. One 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 one, nineteen sixty nine. Yeah, as you move around, you you know you're seeing the sculpture from different viewpoints. Maybe there's nowhere you really get the sense of the sculpture as a whole. To take this photo, someone has had to go up on a stepladder or something, that's not the way you would be viewing it if you were in the gallery space. You wouldn't have any kind of mastering viewpoint like this. You'd just be adding together different viewpoints. It's a little bit like how we experience architecture as an art form, you know. We move through architecture. Sometimes that's forgotten a little bit when you're, when you're 
studying architectural history by looking at photos in a book of facades and floor plans and things, but that's a, 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 an art form, like garden would be another, an art form where your, your embodied movement through space is, is, is key. Sorry, you were going to... Is it large? Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's important that these are, you know, you can't see over the top of it if you're, it, it is kind of, Overwhelming. Well, overwhelming <laughs> you and slightly th threatening you, you know, it's competing with your physical space. Well, all sculpture lives in your physical space, you know, unlike paint the imaginary space of a, inside a painting, but uh, still. One ton prop, House of Cards, 1969. There's a space inside, but you can't get into it. You can sort of look into it, maybe. Circuit, 1972. Yeah, you can see how he's allowed the, the markings on, on the metal to stay there. You know, you see the traces, the indexical signs of, pro of its production are allowed to be there. Site point. This was uh, in Amsterdam. The thing about this one is there's two, sometimes that it, 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 it's not the case, but with this one there is two sort of pretty distinct ways of looking at it that is from the outside like this or inside and that means going in here again it's you know you see the scale of it really large so if you go inside you're, you you know you're definitely hoping that they're there it's gonna <laughs> stay there uh, while you're inside three pieces just folded together as it were just leaning against each other. So gravity is a factor. Yeah? Is that another work behind why kind of yes. like a knot? Uh, I should know who that's by, but I, it's not him. It, I, I can't remember who that's by. No. Yeah, so it's, it's a sort of sculpture garden, I guess, outside the Rijksmuseum. This is the view inside, so it's only black and white. So it, it, uh, it almost becomes um, more clear from the inside that the, the structures has a kind of more, you know, clarity to it. it, it from the outside, it has the visual look as if it's almost falling over, you know, like a leaning tower of Pisa or something like that. But inside, then the logic starts to make more sense. So there are two very distinct viewpoints, the inside and outside. And normally with sculpture you're not on, on the inside. So again, as I say, it's more like a kind of architectural experience. A lot of his works were made in architectural settings and this is the most famous uh, of them, Tilted Ark, made for a government plaza in Lower Manhattan. It's not that it's made to go with an architectural setting. It kind of, it tends to work against the architectural setting. It, it, it it's uh, in a very strong dialogue with the architecture around it. So it really breaks up the space of the plaza. It doesn't um, allow you to to move around. Again, it's taller than you. Blocks views. I'm talking about it in the present tense, but actually it doesn't exist anymore. Sorry, uh, it's um, it was dismantled, and this became a very it became a law case, and and it went on for quite a while, and a lot a lot of issue of discussion because he said, no, this is a site specific work. You, if you move it, you're destroying my work, and you can't destroy my work. That's uh, infringing my rights as an artist. You know. But uh, there's also the rights of the owner, you know, and the rights of the users. 
you know I can't you if you want to get in that door you have to walk around you know every you know lots of people have rights um, so in the end he lost the case and uh, it was taken away um, it's a there's a whole there, you know there's a whole book and many other bits of information that you can go into about that Well, this whole question of, you know, rights are always having to be balanced against others, you know. My right to swing my fist around ends where your nose starts, that kind of trade-off. This is uh, Clara Clara, uh, 1982. Actually, this was one that moved, but he kind of allowed it to move. So maybe he considered it not as 100% uh, site specific. It started off. It's moved twice. In fact, it, in first place, it was was. I think underneath the Pompidou Center. Um, I never saw it there, so I don't know the the story. Uh, and then it moved to the Tuileries Garden, and I think that's where you're seeing it here. And then it had to move again, and it was put in a park in a suburban area of, of Paris and that's where I've seen it it's actually kind of a, a fairly poor part of the city uh, relatively poor part of the city and it's uh, when I saw it had been really covered with graffiti the two um, you know curved walls and a little tiny gap between them I can't remember if I have another no, sorry, I don't have another view, but um, yeah, you can go between them, and you, you have a sense of the, the how it all shifts as you as you're moving through it. So you're very aware of having to to take take it in from different viewpoints, and they're unlike the the sight point when you're inside. It's like you understand the work. It's a, you finally reach a place where it can be explained. But I think for Clara Clara, there's not a place where there's a totality of under understanding. There's no one viewpoint that is a mastering viewpoint. So there's a kind of a, a, a deliberate lack of closure to it. I once, um, I once wrote a, a letter to him about his interest in uh, Japan. He spent some time in Japan. So he, what he wrote back was very simple. Instead of writing sentences, he just wrote names, a list of names. <laughs> so the, the letter is structured like, uh, like his artworks, in a way. Each one is the name of a Zen te temple. So he just says Zazen, you know, doing Zen meditation. Then da da da, Saihoji, Tenrayuji, and so forth. Zen temples in um, Kyoto, mostly, I think. And then just put his name. Sean McCracken. Well, he, he's famous for one type of work, that is these sort of little plank-like works that just sort of lean against walls, so linking floors and walls. You know, we see how someone like Robert Morris is interested in the corners of rooms, so linking walls and uh, floors in McCracken's case. Um, they're about human height, so they have a sort of human presence to them. Blue Post and Lintel, 1965. Uh, yeah, so not everything he did is a plank, but um, you know, some <laughs> have these kind of other structures. But often his work has this, it's very different to Sarah. His works have very pure surfaces. They're, all, they're very, um, it's a kind of lacquer or fiberglass. It's like the kind of the feel of a, a skateboard, uh, sorry, a, um, a surfboard or something like that, the kind of modern items like that with very um, purified surface. The structure here may be 
r reminds of um, of Stonehenge or these kind of uh, that was Stonehenge was something we mentioned when we were talking about Carl Andre and um, uh, certainly I know it's with some interest for John McCracken as well. I, I think the lack of um, touch to the surface gives the work a slightly kind of otherworldly feel as if it's almost like a UFO that's arrived from, from another reality or something like that. I'm thinking of the there's a famous uh, film um, 2001 A Space Odyssey mm -hmm. um, based on the uh, Arthur C. Clarke science fiction book where there's a, at the beginning you see this sort of m strange monolith that appears from nowhere different points in history I think he wants his work to have a little bit of a, a feel like that um, yeah, he's another artist that I've had a correspondence with so he what he says what I try to get in my work are presence beauty stance the pieces should strongly be they should appeal to the senses they should speak they should be doorways into other spaces space times they should be emissaries from other realities inner otherworldly infinite past future my visual influences have been things like Egypt it, sorry, Egyptian architecture and art, and some of those big stone things, Stonehenge included. So that's the sort of thing he's thinking of here. And w when he wrote back to me, he actually included a drawing <laughs> along with his uh, his uh, letter. So. Did you frame it? I have, yeah. <laughs> but I think it's difficult now. I mean, uh, now because of email, you c it's hard to do this kind of thing because, you, you know, if you're an artist, you get these a famous artists, you get these things all, every day. But there was some school kid who used to, you know, in the if you look at the catalogue raisonné of uh, Jackson Pollock, one of the artworks there is a little drawing he did because a school kid wrote to him saying, you know, I'm writing to all the artists asking them to send me a drawing. And, and, and he did, he sent one back. Let, let's have our break now. Sorry, I've, I've gone on a little Sorry. bit because I wanted to get to the point where uh, I finished looking at the sculptural works and now we're looking at the uh, paintings that are in some way similar to to minimalism. Sorry, so yes, we should have our break now.